Why did Nikola Tesla say that 369 was the key to the universe? Nikola Tesla, a brilliant mind ahead of his time, possessed a unique ability to perceive things that often eluded others. One such example is his profound insight into the vast possibilities of electricity, long before his peers could fathom its potential. This raises an intriguing question. Does Tesla's enigmatic 369 theory of the universe hold any substantial merit? Tesla's fascination with the numbers 3, 6 and 9 marked the beginning of his obsession, which led him to believe that these numbers held the ultimate secrets of the universe. Over time, this theory has garnered attention and has been further developed by individuals who seek to enhance their lives by utilizing the practice of manifestation. By diligently writing down their desires repeatedly, these individuals aim to bring them into reality. Tesla's deep fascination with the numbers 3, 6 and 9 served as the catalyst for his ongoing preoccupation. He firmly believed that these specific digits possessed immense significance and could unlock the mysteries of the universe. Nikola Tesla, a renowned inventor and electrical engineer of Serb ethnicity, came into this world on July 10, 1856, within the borders of present-day Croatia. From an early age, Tesla's remarkable intellect set him apart from his peers. In his autobiography, Tesla reminisces about his childhood, where he vividly describes his encounters with out-of-body experiences, transporting him to captivating realms that were seemingly as real and emotionally charged as his experiences in the physical world. Tesla's recollections unveil a fascinating glimpse into the inner workings of his mind, illustrating how his extraordinary mental capabilities allowed him to transcend the boundaries of conventional reality. Tesla possessed a remarkable ability known as an eidetic, or photographic, memory, a cognitive advantage that he effectively employed to conceive and mould his groundbreaking concepts and inventions within his mind before bringing them into tangible existence. When Nikola Tesla embarked on his journey as an adult, he quickly recognized that he possessed a unique disposition compared to his fellow inventors. What set him apart was his remarkable patience, a quality he observed to be lacking in others. Tesla's exceptional capacity for contemplation and careful deliberation allowed him to avoid hasty missteps. This remarkable attribute epitomized his approach to problem-solving and innovation. Unlike his contemporaries, he devoted ample time to thoroughly conceptualizing and refining his ideas before implementation. The inventor's reflective approach proved to be highly effective throughout his professional journey. Despite not achieving great wealth, Tesla managed to produce a remarkable array of groundbreaking creations that still hold significant importance in today's world. Among these notable inventions are the revolutionary concepts of alternating current and the induction motor. Furthermore, Tesla's experiments also ventured into realms previously explored by other innovators, encompassing advancements in areas such as X-rays, neon lights, and remote controls. Tesla's contributions to these fields were profound, leaving a lasting impact on the development and progress of modern technology. In his extensive body of work, renowned inventor Nikola Tesla embarked on a relentless quest to unravel and harness the enigmatic forces that exist in our world. While his groundbreaking experiments with electricity remain widely celebrated, Tesla's insatiable curiosity led him to explore the mystical significance of certain numbers, particularly 3, 6, and 9. Rather than mere numerical values, Tesla perceived these figures as keys to unlocking profound secrets embedded within the fabric of the universe. According to popular belief, Nikola Tesla is believed to have made a remarkable statement that holds profound significance. If one were to fully comprehend the extraordinary nature of the numbers 3, 6, and 9, an invaluable key to unlocking the vast mysteries of the universe would be within reach. Although there is uncertainty surrounding whether the renowned inventor Nikola Tesla actually spoke these famous words, there is no doubt that he possessed an intense fascination with numbers. Upon careful examination, we notice the emergence of a distinct pattern in which certain numbers are consistently absent. Specifically, the numbers 3, 6 and 9 appear to be excluded from this doubling sequence. Threes have held significant importance throughout human history, manifesting in various forms. For instance, triangles, which are characterized by three sides, hold great significance and are commonly found in structures like pyramids. Trinities, such as the well-known Father, Son and Holy Ghost, 
have also played a prominent role in human history. Moreover, the renowned inventor Nikola Tesla identified a trifecta of energy, frequency, and vibration, which he believed encompassed the hidden secrets of the universe. Throughout his lifetime, Nikola Tesla displayed his deep fascination and fixation in various ways. One notable habit was his ritual of circling the block three times before entering a building. This peculiar behavior seemed to symbolize a personal belief or superstitious practice held by Tesla. Additionally, when it came to mundane tasks like washing dishes, he adhered to a specific routine. Interestingly, Tesla would utilize a staggering 18 napkins for this simple task, a number carefully chosen due to its divisibility by 9, 6, and 3. This deliberate choice suggests a meticulous and methodical approach to even the smallest actions. The manifestation of Nikola Tesla's visionary ideas may not align precisely with his initial envisioning of the three mystical numbers, but it serves as undeniable evidence that the enduring power and relevance of his concepts remain unwavering. This remarkable demonstration showcases the robustness and longevity of Tesla's intellectual contributions. Mysterious unidentified objects buzzed three destroyers for several days. According to the Freedom of Information Act records obtained by the news site The Drive, it has been revealed that three destroyers were repeatedly approached by unmanned aerial vehicles over the course of several days. These enigmatic aircraft were referred to as unmanned aerial vehicles in the logs, leaving the true nature of these unidentified crafts a mystery. The obtained records shed light on this intriguing incident, raising questions about the origin and purpose of these objects. The circumstances surrounding these encounters remain largely unknown, leaving room for speculation and further investigation. These unidentified crafts have sparked curiosity and intrigue within the military and aviation communities. According to the disclosed documents, in 2019, there were three unidentified objects that engaged in pursuit and circular maneuvers around three United States warships near the California coastline. These reports further elaborate that one of these crafts exhibited an extraordinary capability by matching the speed and trajectory of a destroyer for a staggering duration exceeding 90 minutes. It is important to note that all the information provided thus far is solely based on the accounts documented in the ship's logs. This intriguing incident raises numerous questions regarding the nature and origin of these unidentified objects, leaving experts and officials baffled. Further investigation and exploration into this phenomenon are necessary to unravel the truth behind these enigmatic encounters. The USS Kidd encountered a series of enigmatic objects, sparking intrigue and speculation among numerous sources. While some have hastily labelled these objects as drones, the official ship's logs describe them as unidentified aerial crafts. According to the detailed accounts in the logs, up to six of these crafts were observed manoeuvring audaciously in the vicinity of the ship. The logs further elaborate on the sightings, stating, Kidd reported an unmanned aerial vehicle directly above, identified as a white light hovering over the ship's flight deck. Additionally, two unidentified objects were sighted on the starboard wing, followed by four more UAVs six minutes later near the starboard bridge. These intriguing events have generated significant curiosity and speculation among experts and observers alike. The logs serve as a testament to the highly unusual and captivating nature of these encounters. It is worth noting that the Navy vessels in question are equipped with state-of-the-art technology, including advanced sensors, radar systems, thermal imaging capabilities, and cutting-edge electro-optical systems. Despite the impressive array of tools at their disposal, none of these sophisticated technologies were able to track or identify the mysterious crafts that were observed. The Navy, confronted with the perplexing situation of encountering unidentified objects, turned to other agencies, such as the Coast Guard, FBI, and various authorities in an attempt to unravel the enigma. Regrettably, despite their collaborative efforts, the investigation ultimately proved unsuccessful in providing a conclusive explanation for the nature or origin of these elusive airborne entities. The inability to unveil the truth surrounding these occurrences remains a challenging and unresolved mystery. There has been growing speculation surrounding the possibility of unidentified crafts closely observing ships, raising questions about their intentions. This phenomenon is not new, 
as there have been repeated reports of such unidentified crafts near our ships. Interestingly, even ex-servicemen have come forward to share their perplexing encounters with these mysterious objects. Notably, these sightings primarily occur around bodies of water, differentiating them from conventional unidentified flying objects. This has led experts to coin the term unidentified submerged objects to describe this distinct group of sightings. Intriguingly, USOs bear a strong resemblance to UFOs, prompting some to ponder whether they are truly distinct entities or if UFOs possess the capability to submerge without detection. Clearly, further exploration is necessary to shed light on these intriguing phenomena and uncover their true nature. Reports regarding unidentified submerged objects have been a recurring topic of discussion for numerous years, originating from highly reliable sources. One notable incident recounted by former US Navy Commander David Frevor sheds light on an intriguing encounter. During a routine drone retrieval mission, Fravor witnessed a large, dark mass beneath the water's surface. Describing it as a circular entity, this enigmatic object sparked curiosity. Astonishingly, upon a subsequent sighting of the enigmatic mass, a practice torpedo that Fravor had been tasked with recovering was mysteriously drawn into the depths of the ocean, never to resurface again. Such incidents involving USOs have captivated the attention of experts and researchers, and their exploration has been ongoing to uncover the truth behind these encounters. While the existence of USOs remains a subject of debate, the credibility of the sources reporting these occurrences cannot be ignored. The intricacies and complexities of these submerged phenomena continue to puzzle scientific communities worldwide. Unidentified submerged objects often masquerade as ordinary objects that appear distorted beneath the ocean's surface. However, due to their extensive knowledge and experience with the sea, trained Navy personnel possess a heightened awareness of their surroundings. Consequently, when military officials assert having encountered a USO or UFO sighting, their claims attain a greater sense of credibility. Deepening our understanding of USOs requires recognizing that these submerged phenomena go beyond conventional explanations. Reports regarding unidentified submerged objects have been recorded for several years, with some instances even attracting the attention of nuclear submarines equipped with highly sensitive listening technology. Numerous individuals who prefer to maintain their anonymity have willingly shared their encounters with these mysterious submerged objects. One notable incident occurred in 2007 off the coast of Half Moon Bay, California, when a witness aboard the cruise ship Dawn Princess, now known as Pacific Explorer since its renaming in 2017, claimed to have witnessed three UFOs. These objects were observed in a uniform formation, evenly spaced and parallel to the ship's hull, hovering just above the water's surface. The objects, nearly spherical and emitting a glowing light, appeared to remain stationary while the ship passed by. Interestingly, despite their presence, the objects did not disturb or disrupt the water below them. As the witness's line of sight shifted and the objects disappeared from view, the object on the far left made a sudden splash, vanishing beneath the water's surface. This extraordinary encounter prompts further exploration into the enigmatic nature of these unidentified submerged objects. Another individual who was aboard a cruise ship recounted a similar occurrence, describing how as they approached the coast of Florida, both she and her spouse bore witness to a perplexing event. The sudden ingress of an unidentified circular object into the tranquil waters. This enigmatic entity resembled the shape of a disc and astonishingly made no discernible disturbance upon submersion. Noteworthily, her esteemed husband, boasting an extensive aviation career spanning over three decades, confirmed that nothing he had ever encountered resembled the peculiar phenomenon witnessed that day. Filled with curiosity, they diligently scanned the surroundings, hoping for the reappearance of the submerged craft, but unfortunately, it remained concealed beneath the depths, leaving them both perplexed and intrigued. It is certainly intriguing to observe the increasing openness of the Navy and other military branches toward acknowledging the existence of unidentified flying objects. Individuals who have personally witnessed UFO phenomena express their satisfaction with the growing acceptance and seriousness afforded to such encounters. Additionally, it is worth noting that in the near future, the United States will be compelled to disclose all information pertaining to UFOs, 
potentially indicating a preparatory measure to acclimate the public to forthcoming revelations. Irrespective of these developments, proponents of the UFO phenomenon eagerly anticipate the long-awaited disclosure and emphasize the necessity of divulging the truth to the general populace. It is evident that a comprehensive understanding and exploration of this subject matter is of utmost importance to shed light on the reality that has been shrouded in mystery for so long. It is crucial to bear in mind that more than 80% of our planet's vast oceans remain unexplored, leaving a significant portion of the underwater realm shrouded in mystery. This enigmatic domain continues to captivate scientists and researchers year after year, unraveling astonishing revelations. Astonishingly, experts estimate that a staggering 1,000 to 2,000 previously unknown species come to light annually, underscoring the limited extent of our knowledge about the hidden wonders beneath the waves. Furthermore, daring underwater archaeologists have been unearthing ancient ruins, providing glimpses into past civilizations that thrived in these submerged territories. As time progresses, it is highly probable that scientists and avid explorers will stumble upon even more captivating discoveries, although reaching a consensus on their findings may prove to be a challenge. The untapped depths of the ocean hold endless possibilities for expanding our understanding of the marine world. A US Navy officer reveals that something was detected on radar traveling hundreds of knots underwater. Believers in the realm of the unknown have consistently advocated for vigilance in observing the vast expanses of the sky. However, it appears that we may have inadvertently overlooked a significant location in our quest for answers, our very own oceans. Amidst the whispers and murmurs that have persisted throughout history regarding enigmatic vessels sighted in and around our marine territories, it is fascinating to note that both seasoned fishermen and esteemed Navy officials have braved the skepticism to come forth and meticulously recount their perplexing encounters. While these individuals' testimonies were met with attempts to downplay and dismiss their claims by authorities and skeptics, recent revelations, comprising official documents, corroborative testimonies and first-hand accounts, have undeniably revalidated their assertions. Astonishingly, various pilots and Navy officials have now validated these earlier reports, affirming the existence of elusive crafts surreptitiously traversing our fathomless oceanic depths. According to recent reports, United States submarines have made the curious discovery of unidentified underwater vehicles, which are said to be maneuvering at remarkable speeds deep beneath the ocean's surface. This intriguing revelation was brought to light by Tom Rogan, who revealed that the United States Navy possesses compelling evidence in the form of data substantiating these encounters. Apparently, these enigmatic high-speed crafts have been observed buzzing around naval ships before vanishing into thin air with remarkable agility. This revelation has left both military personnel and experts in the field puzzled as they grapple with the mysterious nature and capabilities of these underwater vessels. Mr. Rogan said the following about the reports. I think what we may well be looking at is a true unknown, which is to say, intelligently controlled machinery that is not understood to be in the possession of the United States, China or Russia, which are the three most advanced countries in terms of military aviation. Researching this, there isn't anything that we have, top secret information about what China or Russia have, or what we have at any of our top secret installations, that can do what these things do in terms of performance. In the coming months and years, an area we will learn more about is the interaction between US Navy submarines, nuclear ballistic submarines, and attack submarines. Picking up sonar contact of things moving at hundreds of knots under the water. So there is an undersea dimension to this, that the Navy has sort of pushed off to the side as the pilots talk more about their experiences. One of the things we're going to find is that, over a period of decades, a lot of the data, a lot of the measurement of these things, has been put off as a technical aberration, or essentially a data malfunction, because they didn't want to really admit that something very serious and special is going on. End quote. Researchers have indicated that the United States Navy possesses a thorough understanding of the nature of these peculiar entities. However, they have chosen to withhold substantial information regarding these phenomena at present. Some amateur researchers have suggested that Navy officials have previously disclosed their observations about these enigmatic crafts. According to their accounts, these unidentified submerged objects, as they have come to be known, 
exhibit remarkable characteristics, such as entering and exiting the ocean seamlessly, employing an unprecedented form of propulsion, and maneuvering below the water surface without creating any discernible disturbance. Additionally, it has been reported that these enigmatic crafts surpass conventional aircraft, such as jets, in terms of maneuverability. Despite the prevalence of discussions surrounding unidentified flying objects, USOs have received relatively less attention, leaving us with a substantial knowledge gap regarding these submerged anomalies. Over the years, numerous witnesses have described witnessing luminous phenomena emerging from the depths of the water, swiftly soaring into the skies at astonishing velocities. The fact that even nuclear submarines, equipped with state-of-the-art acoustic surveillance systems, have failed to elucidate their origin further underscores the necessity of affording this subject matter the seriousness it deserves. Astronomer Mark D'Antonio was taken for a ride on an attack submarine, and while on there, the sub encountered an unknown, fast-moving object on sonar. He said the following, As a thank you for doing some work for them, the Navy asked me if I wanted to go for a ride in a submarine, so I said yes. Once we got under, I was sitting in the sonar station, and the sonar operator was sitting right next to me. Submarines are loud, people think they are very quiet, and it's true that they are on the outside because the sound doesn't get out, but inside you hear everything. I was sitting there zoning out a little because I was seasick, and all of a sudden the sonar kid says, fast mover, fast mover, and I'm jolted awake thinking what's happening, is it a torpedo? The executive officer comes out, and the operator shows him the path of the object, and the officer says, how fast is that going? And the kid said, several hundred knots. I started to lean forward to listen in, and the officer said, can you confirm it? So he went to another sonar machine and confirmed it wasn't a machine anomaly. It was real. I thought that was incredible. When the sonar guy said, what do I do with this? The officer said, log it and dog it. In other words, log it and bury it. Four years later, Mark asked a senior naval figure about what he saw, saying the following, can you tell me about the fast mover program? He looked at me and said, Sorry Mark, I can't talk about that program. So he basically confirmed to me that the program exists. There's definitely no shortage of these mysterious crafts, and recent comments by US officials have only caused people to demand answers for what these objects are. The mysterious case involving a luxury hotel in Oslo. On the fateful day of June 3, 1995, an incident unfolded at Oslo's renowned Plaza Hotel, sending shockwaves throughout Norway and beyond. The body of a woman was discovered within the premises, her demise presumed to be self-inflicted due to a single pistol wound. The presence of a firearm clasped in her hand seemingly confirmed the grim conclusion. However, this perplexing case bore an uncanny resemblance to the enigmatic Isdal woman, as all identifying labels had been meticulously eradicated from her clothing, shrouding her true identity in ambiguity. Whispers permeated through the corridors, hinting at the involvement of organized crime syndicates and clandestine international espionage. Now, over 25 years have passed, and the relentless pursuit of truth by investigators seems poised to penetrate the veil of mystery, enshrouding the woman in room 2805, potentially unraveling one of the most enduring enigmas in the annals of Norwegian crime. The Radisson SAS Plaza Hotel, now known as the Radisson Blue Plaza Hotel, occupies a prominent position in the Norwegian capital and stands tall at 384 feet, making it the second tallest building in the country. Completed in 1989, this architectural marvel exemplifies the epitome of a modern five-star hotel. With its impressive 37 floors, it boasts a staggering total of 673 rooms and can accommodate up to 1,500 guests comfortably. Over the years, the Radisson has attracted the attention of millionaires, international celebrities, and individuals from the upper echelons of society, making it the preferred choice for the rich and famous. However, it was a specific room within the hotel, room 2805, that gained notoriety in 1995 and became the subject of intense interest and speculation. It was shortly after 7.30 in the evening when Evie Tudum Gertsen, a receptionist at the Plaza Hotel, became aware that something was amiss in room 2805. The room had been registered under the names of two individuals, Jennifer and Lois Fairgate, who were Belgian nationals. However, upon investigating the matter, 
it was discovered that their credit card had apparently exceeded its limit. This particular room, located in what was commonly referred to as the Tower, was renowned for being one of the most luxurious accommodations at the Radisson. In terms of cost, it amounted to approximately $330 per night in today's currency. Surprisingly, despite having stayed for three nights already, the occupants had not made any payment whatsoever, even though they had received messages regarding their outstanding balance in the preceding days. The circumstances surrounding how these individuals managed to stay at the hotel, without prepaying or providing any payment guarantees, remain a mystery to this day. However, it is worth noting that certain witnesses have observed a lack of diligence on the part of some hotel staff members. This incident raises questions not only about the accountability of the guests, but also about the responsibility of the hotel personnel in ensuring proper payment and adherence to policy. Former Plaza Hotel receptionist Tudem Gjertsen expressed her utter bewilderment when she stated to Verdun's gang that she found the situation completely incomprehensible. In accordance with her training, Gjertsen performed her duties flawlessly, employing the TV screen as a means to relay a message to the room, urgently requesting someone to get in touch with the cashier. The TV system was under the control of a remote, and a prompt response was received when an individual pressed the OK button to acknowledge the message. This process was executed precisely according to the established protocol and demonstrated Gjertsen's adeptness in implementing the necessary procedures. Upon realizing that the room hadn't been cleaned in several days and a Do Not Disturb sign was hanging on the door, Gjertsen's dissatisfaction grew. Seeking to address the issue, she engaged in conversation with other staff members, discovering that the situation was far more concerning than she initially thought. As a result, she made the decision to contact the security department for assistance. Responding promptly to Gertsen's call, security guard Espen Nice swiftly arrived at the room. With cautious determination, he approached the door and knocked, only to be met with the unsettling sound of a gunshot resonating from inside. Immediately realizing the gravity of the situation, Nayes instinctively sought cover in a small alcove nearby. Fearing that there may be another armed individual in the room who had fired the shot, he prioritized his safety and abstained from divulging any of this information to his colleagues. Despite being aware that there might be an active shooter present within the premises, Nayes opted to avoid causing panic among the other staff members. Instead, he discreetly retreated to the guard station, leaving room 2805 unattended and vulnerable. Although the potential threat loomed, Nice deemed it crucial to handle the situation discreetly and without inciting unnecessary alarm. The head of the security team was immediately notified of the situation and wasted no time in contacting the local authorities. Taking matters into his own hands, the supervisor proceeded to the room in question, hoping for a response from inside. However, his attempts proved futile as there was no reply. It was then that he made the decision to unlock the door only to be hit by an overwhelming and unpleasant odour that permeated the air. Although the exact nature of the smell could not be determined, it was suspected to be a combination of propellant and the unmistakable stench of death, accompanied by the scent of blood and bodily fluids. Despite the room being shrouded in darkness, the distinct outline of a woman lying on the bed caught the supervisor's attention. The position in which she lay appeared to be quite unnatural, raising immediate concern. The security personnel called out, but received no response from the lifeless figure before him. Recognizing the tragic truth that she had met her demise, he promptly exited the room and patiently awaited the arrival of the police. It was approximately five minutes past eight when the initial alert was raised, and unfortunately, the law enforcement officers arrived nearly 50 minutes later to assess the somber situation. After conducting a thorough investigation, law enforcement officials discovered that the woman had sustained a fatal wound to the forehead, resulting in their immediate passing. Notably, there were no indications of any other individuals present at the scene. Remarkably, the firearm found at the scene was identified as a browning, still grasped firmly in the victim's hands. However, its positioning was highly unusual, as the thumb was resting on the trigger. The firearm had been discharged twice, once as a trial shot, piercing a nearby pillow, and a second time, causing a fatal injury to the woman's head. As the crime scene investigators meticulously combed through the room for any potential evidence, other confidential statements were also taken into consideration. 
Ultimately, it appeared that the woman had taken her own life. Supporting this conclusion was the discovery that both keycards granting access to the room were found inside, while the door had been securely double-locked, ensuring limited entry only through the hotel's security personnel. Furthermore, although the window was found to be open, its location on the 28th floor strongly diminished the likelihood of it being used as an entry or exit point. Subsequent reports consistently concurred with the initial findings, firmly attesting that the woman had indeed taken her own life. The hotel's internal report, providing a detailed analysis of the incident, expressed a 99% certainty that this devastating act was the result of self-inflicted actions carried out by the deceased individual. Their comprehensive conclusion was reached based on a careful examination of all available information and supporting evidence. In spite of efforts to downplay it, that minuscule fragment of uncertainty, constituting a mere 0.1%, appears to possess a significance far weightier than initially acknowledged. While every piece of evidence undeniably highlights the Oslo Plaza woman's solitary presence within the confines of that room, certain peculiarities emerge that demand attention. Notably, the absence of any trace of residue or blood on her hands raises eyebrows. The meticulous obliteration of the firearm's serial number through the skillful application of acid further adds to the enigma. Additionally, a discovery was made within her bag, precisely 25 rounds of ammunition with no accompanying items. Curiously evocative of the infamous Isdal woman case, all labels adorning the woman's attire were meticulously removed. Similarly to the preceding unsolved death, the identity of the victim remains an unfathomable enigma to all. Torlev Ola Rognum, a highly experienced and esteemed forensic medicine professor who holds the position of Norway's top forensic medical expert, expressed his perplexity regarding the absence of backspatter or burn on the victim's hands. Rognum, in an interview with Verdun's gang, found it unusual and raised concerns about this peculiar observation. Forensic expert Rognum expressed his astonishment at the unusual nature of the situation. The presence of a remarkable splatter of blood on the ceiling, combined with the victim's thumb still resting on the trigger and her fingers firmly grasping the grip, raised intriguing questions. However, what puzzled him even more was the absence of any blood traces on her hands. This discrepancy, or lack thereof, left Rognum perplexed and deeply intrigued. As someone experienced in the field of forensics, this particular detail stood out as incredibly striking and worthy of careful examination. The Isdal woman case, which unfolded in 1970, was hindered by the absence of advanced policing techniques and technology, ultimately leading to the failure to identify the victim. However, the Oslo woman displayed a remarkable level of expertise in evading detection. It appears that she deliberately altered her appearance by sporting short black hair. Notably, there were no belongings found that could provide any clues about her identity. No passport, purse, Idaho cards or documents were recovered. In addition, there was an absence of credit cards and driver's license. The only potential lead was the Belgian origin of the gun she carried and her claim of residing on Rue de la Stede in Verlaine, Belgium. Surprisingly, investigations revealed that the street does not exist, nor does the supposed company she mentioned, Service. However, the connection to Belgium was strengthened through phone records, indicating that she attempted to make calls to incorrect numbers during her stay. Based on similar nearby area codes, it is speculated that these calls were meant for Grace Halone or Serraing, neighbouring municipalities of Verlaine. It is possible that she simply dialed the wrong number, hinting at the likelihood of a miscommunication or faulty memory. The Browning, a widely recognised and potent firearm, is extensively utilised by law enforcement agencies, military organisations and even individuals involved in criminal activities. With countless units of this firearm in circulation, it is evident that its popularity knows no bounds. In an intriguing turn of events, a mysterious woman appears to have been oblivious to the characteristics of this weapon, as she tested its sound-dampening abilities by firing a shot into a pillow. It is worth noting that firearms are not typically the weapon of choice for women contemplating doing this to themselves. However, even someone lacking experience would have recognized that 25 rounds, in addition to the seven rounds already loaded in the magazine, far exceeded what would be necessary for a self-inflicted demise. This raises several compelling questions. According to Leonard Kerdelin, the criminal watch commander, 
There is no evidence to indicate that this incident was anything other than someone wanting to take their own life. However, it is exceptionally uncommon to come across cases where women have taken their own lives by using a firearm. In fact, in all his years of experience, Leonard states that he has never encountered such a situation before, nor has he encountered one since. Intriguingly, the gun and magazine did not yield any identifiable fingerprints, but this should not be immediately perceived as suspicious. Contrary to what is often depicted in police dramas, successfully lifting prints from the surface of a firearm is an arduous task in reality. Thus, the absence of fingerprints should not automatically suggest that the weapon was meticulously wiped clean. Nonetheless, the possibility of the gun being cleaned cannot be entirely overlooked. It is worth noting that if the gun was indeed cleaned, it would not be the sole missing piece of evidence from the crime scene, adding an additional layer of complexity to the investigation. The reason behind the removal of the manufacturing and laundry labels from her clothing was not solely to prevent any kind of irritation. In fact, the labels were systematically cut away, going to the extent of removing even the manufacturer's name from her shoes. Interestingly, only one label managed to survive this label removal spree, which happened to be on a René Lazard jacket that was originally sold in Germany. There was also a bag that still bore the brand label of the German manufacturer Travelite. These particular labels were intentionally left intact, as removing them would have caused damage to the linings of the products. This deliberate act showcased a meticulous and thorough approach towards eliminating any trace of identification or branding. While René Lazard may not be considered one of the top-tier fashion houses and its price range is not exorbitant, the company still garners recognition for its impeccable style, appealing especially to women who are conscious of their appearance. However, it is intriguing to note that there were no toiletries or cosmetics in the women's room, aside from an empty bottle of cologne. What adds to the mystery is the fact that this fragrance is typically designed for men. While it is plausible that the bottle belonged to the man who was reportedly seen with her, it is equally possible that the bottle never contained cologne at all. It makes one wonder if the bottle symbolized a lost love, as empty perfume bottles can retain the fragrance for numerous years. Additionally, it is worth mentioning that the only fingerprints found on the bottle belonged to the victim, further deepening the enigma surrounding the situation. The examination following the unfortunate demise yielded limited findings. The medical examiner determined that the deceased individual, contrary to what was stated in the hotel records, was actually older, falling within the age range of 25 to 35 rather than 21. Furthermore, she possessed distinctive physical attributes, such as short black hair and captivating blue eyes. Standing at a height of 5 feet 3 inches and weighing 147 pounds, she had a noticeable presence. A notable aspect of her physical appearance was her meticulously crafted dental work, which boasted the usage of premium materials like porcelain and gold, a practice commonly observed in countries such as the United States, Germany, Denmark and Switzerland. Although her dental work was of exceptional quality, no matches were discovered, leaving the mystery unsolved. Additionally, attempts to link her fingerprints to any existing records were futile. Oddly enough, while the deceased tested negative for alcohol consumption, no inquiries were made into anything else. Despite the fact that taking her own life was the main focus of the investigation, Assistant Chief of Police Gunnar Larsen felt unsatisfied with the numerous unresolved questions surrounding the case. To thoroughly unravel the mysterious death of the unidentified woman and determine her true identity, a team of five skilled detectives was assigned to delve into the circumstances. Remarkably, even three weeks after the incident, the authorities were still hesitant to conclusively declare it as this, indicating the level of complexity and uncertainty surrounding the case. The commitment of these experienced investigators to uncover the truth and provide closure to this puzzling tragedy highlights the importance of meticulous investigation and the pursuit of justice. According to Assistant Chief of Police Gunnar Larsen, the circumstances surrounding the passing of the woman remain uncertain. It is unclear whether she tragically took her own life or if she was the victim of foul play by unidentified individuals. The police have numerous unanswered questions in relation to this case, as the ongoing investigation has not provided conclusive answers thus far. During their investigation, the police conducted interviews with the hotel staff at the Plaza Hotel. Based on these interviews, 
It was determined that the woman in question had checked into the hotel on May 31st at 10.44 in the evening. Under the name Jennifer Fairgate, she mistakenly signed her assumed name as Fergate. Surprisingly, the receptionist did not request any form of identification from her. Additionally, she mentioned that a certain Lois Fairgate would be accompanying her during her stay, although the receptionist had the impression that she was alone. However, other individuals who were questioned recalled seeing the woman in the company of a man. Their descriptions suggested that the man was in his mid-thirties to early forties. It is worth noting that the woman initially made her booking in English, but when she called to confirm, she spoke in German. Further investigation revealed that for the most part, the woman remained within the confines of her hotel room throughout her stay. However, there was an exception during the early morning hours of June 1st to June 2nd. During this time frame, she was observed being outside her room between 12.34 and 8.50 in the morning. The activities she engaged in during those hours and the subsequent day have never been uncovered or established. This detailed account of the events and circumstances surrounding the woman's stay at the Plaza Hotel provides a comprehensive and enriched understanding of the situation. A maid at the hotel recalled that she had seen a nice pair of shoes in the closet of room 2805 during this period of absence, and they were no longer amongst the items thought to belong to the deceased. Indeed, a considerable amount may have been missing from the room, with Jennifer found to have a very odd assortment of clothing. These included four jackets but only one blouse. She had one sweater but no trousers or skirts. Equally, the clothing wouldn't fit in the travelite bag. A witness reported that Jennifer had arrived at the Plaza Hotel with a wheeled suitcase and wearing a suit jacket with a skirt, leading her to assume that the victim had been a flight attendant as it was typically airline crews that had this type of luggage at the time. The witness believed she was from British Airways. Neither the suitcase nor the skirt was in the room. In a recent interview with Verdon's gang, Tom Storm Olson, a retired police officer, expressed his belief that the woman in question must have been caught in a dire circumstance. However, due to the lack of information about her identity, it is difficult to ascertain the exact reasons behind her actions. Mr. Olson also speculated that there could potentially be criminal elements involved. The police force entertained various conjectures regarding the true identity of the individual referred to as Jennifer. Among them was the speculation that she could potentially be the missing spouse of a mafia leader. However, this initial theory was swiftly invalidated. There were also suspicions of a potential connection to illicit drugs, with some suggesting the possible involvement of intelligence agencies or even proposing that the woman herself was an assassin. Nevertheless, these hypotheses eventually proved to be fruitless and were ultimately discarded. Subsequently, on June 26, 1996, the unidentified Oslo woman was laid to rest in an unmarked grave at Oslo's Vestra Gravlund Cemetery. Interestingly, a mere two months later, the police authorities made the decision to either destroy or sell off all the evidence associated with the case, including her clothing, jewellery, luggage and even the firearm. The investigation conducted by the police forensics department revealed that the gun, which had its serial numbers deliberately removed, was ultimately recovered. In 2017, the Norwegian newspaper Verdens Gang stumbled upon the firearm while journalist Lars Christian Wegner was carrying out a fresh inquiry into the case, a pursuit he had been diligently following since 1998. As Wegner made this discovery, he reached out to experts who examined the weapon and made an intriguing observation. Contrary to the initial assumption that it was an authentic Browning, these experts contended that it was, in fact, a Hungarian replica assembled from various components. While the barrel matched the original Browning, the remaining parts were determined to be significantly older, likely hailing from the 1960s or 1970s and possibly having a military background. This revelation shed new light on the firearm's origins, raising questions about its true history and purpose. Wegner's subsequent investigations have brought to light an additional captivating element, which revolves around an individual who occupied room 2804. Referred to as Mr. F in public, this individual was of Belgian origin. On the day of the unfortunate incident, precisely at six minutes past eight in the evening, a woman going by the name of Jennifer Fairgate placed an order for food to be delivered to her room. 
The specific choice was a delectable combination of bratwurst and potato salad, known as the Hot Bite. The responsibility of delivering the meal was entrusted to Kristin Anderson, the supervisor in charge of room service. However, due to a mix-up in room numbers, the food was mistakenly taken to room 2804 instead of 2805, which happened to be occupied by Mr. F across the corridor. Subsequently, this error was rectified, and the mysterious woman promptly received her meal in the adjacent room. Displaying appreciation for the service rendered, she generously tipped 50 kroner, leaving behind a sense of intrigue. Crime scene investigators made a startling revelation when they examined the room where the incident took place. Surprisingly, most of the food in the room remained untouched, despite the assumption that it was supposed to be the final meal of the victim. This peculiar observation was not just a mere coincidence, as it served as a clue indicating the presence of someone in the room. While it may have been easily overlooked, the discovery of a USA Today newspaper in the deceased woman's room added another intriguing layer to the mystery. It came to light that these newspapers had been distributed to all the hotel guests free of charge. However, the newspaper found in the victim's room was not meant for either room 2805 or 2804. Instead, it had been intended for room 2816. This discrepancy raised questions about whether the woman had been spying on her fellow residents, illegally entering their rooms, or if it was simply another mistake. To delve deeper into the investigation, a fingerprint was recovered from the bag containing the misplaced newspaper, and it has recently been forwarded to Interpol for further analysis. Curiously, the identity of the individual who stayed in room 2816 remains a mystery, as they have never been traced. This crucial information opens up new possibilities and leads for the investigators to pursue, hoping to unravel the intricate web of events surrounding this perplexing crime scene. According to documents provided by the police, it was revealed that a person identified as Mr. F had been present in Oslo for work purposes. Originating from the French-speaking region of Belgium, he managed to leave before any questioning took place on the morning of the reported incident. As part of the investigation, Lars Christian Wegner attempted to engage with this individual in order to gather information. However, the man was initially reluctant to speak and abruptly ended communication when he learned that journalists wanted to discuss the Oslo incident. Undeterred, the persistent Wegner made the journey to Belgium to personally interview the individual, determined to uncover further details. Mr. F's comment reveals a vivid memory of the incident, triggered by the subsequent inquiry made by the front desk personnel. Although situated within close proximity to the aforementioned incident, his slumber was undisturbed and devoid of any knowledge concerning the event. Based on the available records and the timing of the unfortunate incident, it is highly unlikely that the front desk could have informed Mr. F about the incident that occurred later in the evening, especially considering he had already checked out in the morning. This fact has been verified through official documentation. Despite several attempts to reach out to Mr. F for further clarification, he has not responded, leaving us perplexed as to why he would provide misleading information. It is plausible that he might be mistaken or simply unwilling to involve himself in the matter. However, it remains unclear why he would choose to withhold any pertinent details. In the month of November in the year 2016, significant progress was made in the ongoing investigation of the Oslo woman's case. A noteworthy development occurred when authorities decided to exhume the body of the Oslo woman in order to obtain DNA analysis. This crucial step was taken to gather further evidence and shed light on the mysterious circumstances surrounding her passing. Investigators collected samples from both the teeth and bones of the subject in question. These samples were then sent to the Institute for Legal Medicine at Innsbruck Medical University in Austria for analysis. The results of the analysis revealed a complete DNA profile, verifying that the Oslo woman most likely had European ancestry. To further narrow down her origins, Professor Jurian Hugerwerf from the University of Canberra in Australia conducted a detailed examination of the woman's teeth, which ultimately pointed towards Germany. However, delving deeper into the investigation, Professor Druid from Stockholm conducted additional analysis, unveiling that the woman was born in 1971 and was approximately 24 years old at the time of her death, with a slim margin of error of only 1.1 years. This comprehensive investigation has shed light on crucial details surrounding the Oslo woman's identity and the circumstances surrounding her demise. 
The information derived is consistent with the limited evidence discovered in the room. It is worth noting that both the jacket and bag belonging to the woman from Oslo had German origins. Furthermore, she conversed with the hotel staff in the German language without any discernible accent. Additionally, there are indications that her dental work may have been done in Germany. While she displayed a certain level of familiarity with Belgium, specifically the Valais region, there is no concrete evidence to suggest that she actually hails from that particular area. As the enigma surrounding the identity of the Oslo woman gradually unravels, so does the possibility of uncovering the true circumstances pertaining to her untimely demise. Despite the Oslo police's official stance, the lingering questions that were initially assigned to the detectives remain unresolved. Delving deeper into the perplexing case, one cannot help but wonder about the intricate details surrounding her entry into the country. Furthermore, the origins of the firearm used in the incident pique curiosity. Was it surreptitiously smuggled through customs, evading scrutiny, or was it acquired within Norwegian borders? Equally puzzling is the fate of her personal belongings and crucial documents, which seem to have mysteriously vanished without a trace. The Isdal woman case, a perplexing and unsolved mystery in Norway, may have had a direct influence on events in Oslo. Many of the existing theories regarding the operations of security services fail to truly grasp their functioning. These theories often stem from Cold War fiction rather than factual basis. In reality, undercover agents prioritize the creation of a foolproof backstory, unlike the Oslo woman whose false backstory was easily transparent. To avoid raising suspicion, they would unquestionably ensure that they paid for their hotel accommodations themselves. Additionally, possessing a firearm like the supposed Cold War relic, the Browning, would be unnecessary for agents. Lastly, unless an agent was killed in an operation likely to spark an international scandal, they would not be disowned and left in an unmarked grave if they were affiliated with MI6 or the CIA. However, it should be noted that this may not necessarily be the case for other intelligence agencies. By delving into these details, we can gain a comprehensive understanding of the limitations and discrepancies within these theories and their portrayal of security services operations. However, it is important to consider alternative explanations for this discrepancy. Mr. F's behavior and statement also arouse suspicion, but it is possible that he simply fears being implicated in a potential crime or has personal reasons for wanting to avoid public attention. It is worth noting that one speculation suggests that Jennifer Fairgate may have been involved in the high-end escort industry. This hypothesis adds another layer of complexity to the case and requires further investigation. To fully comprehend the intricate dynamics at play, a thorough exploration of all possible scenarios, including the possibility of a staged suicide and involvement of individuals with hidden motives, is imperative. Only by delving into the depths of the case can a comprehensive understanding be achieved. According to Ola Kaldiger, who previously led the highly classified Norwegian intelligence group E14, Norway, Sweden and Austria served as typical safe havens for intelligence services to gather and operate without disruption. These countries were characterized by their openness, lack of suspicion and limited police oversight. Their favorable qualities, such as efficient infrastructure and loose travel restrictions, made them easily accessible to intelligence operatives. Kaldaga suggests that much clandestine activity may have taken place unnoticed by the general public in these nations. These safe havens provided a conducive environment for intelligence agencies to convene confidential meetings and carry out their operations covertly. When considering the absence of any records pertaining to the Oslo woman, it is crucial to explore the influence of the state apparatus. An intriguing explanation arises when examining the possibility that she hailed from the former East Germany, as numerous individuals speculate. In this case, it becomes conceivable that her records could have been intentionally destroyed by the notorious Stasi, the former Ministry for State Security. During a defining era that witnessed the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany, the Stasi engaged in the destruction of countless files, including a multitude of birth records and police documents. It is important to acknowledge the significant impact that such actions by the Stasi had in eradicating any trace of the Oslo woman's existence. If the unidentified woman had been residing in the country for an extended period of time, acquiring a gun may not have posed a challenge. 
The lingering scent of the cologne she wore may hold sentimental value, possibly serving as a reminder of a lost love or a significant connection to the Plaza Hotel from her past. By ensuring her identity would remain forever concealed, she might have believed that her loved ones would cope better with her disappearance rather than the devastating reality of what was going to happen. Drawing inspiration from the notorious Isdal woman case, she meticulously removed the clothing tags and scattered her belongings throughout Oslo during the limited periods when she left her room. Unfortunately, as security knocked on her door, she tragically took her own life, leaving no time to dispose of the remaining evidence. Perhaps she feared that it was the police approaching, anticipating the discovery of either her true identity or the weapon itself. Regrettably, the unanswered calls she failed to place to Belgium could be seen as her desperate plea for help before reaching her breaking point. No matter what the underlying cause of the woman's demise in room 2805 may be, the woman known as Jennifer is deeply missed by her friends, brothers and sisters, all of whom ponder incessantly about her mysterious whereabouts. Despite their unwavering hope that she may one day reappear, sparing them the heart-wrenching truth, they are left without any closure or the opportunity to bid a final farewell. The Vela Incident The Vela satellite is located near the Prince Edward Islands in the Indian Ocean. It was constructed as a reaction to the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which ensured that nuclear reactors or explosions could not be tested anywhere due to the deadly and detrimental effects of nuclear energy. The Vela satellite is able to detect nuclear explosions and send signals to intelligence agencies to warn them of the presence of dangerous and illegal nuclear energy. The Vela satellite is equipped with technology that can detect X-rays, neutrons and gamma rays by using bang meter sensors. It is an extremely advanced piece of technology and essential for both human and environmental safety. On September 22, 1979, the Vela satellite detected the infamous double flash indicating that a nuclear explosion had occurred. This detection on the satellite is now commonly known as the South Atlantic Flash. The flash lit up the sky not only once, but twice, and was remarked as an incredible natural event. However, the true cause of the double flash remains a mystery. The United States and other countries alike predicted that the Vela satellite flash might have occurred due to natural phenomenon such as a meteor crash or lightning strike. To investigate this further, meteorological technology was introduced into study but was unable to detect whether nature was responsible for this. This technology was unable to prove the exact cause for the detonation. However, it did show that a wind had occurred over the southern Indian Ocean that might have carried nuclear explosive radiation or chemicals to certain parts of Australia. After an investigation from the United States Department of Defense within the Indian Ocean and surrounding countries, they predicted that it is possible that a nuclear test had occurred within the region of South Africa or Israel but there was not enough evidence to conclude that a nuclear threat was present. There are several conspiracies as to why the Vela satellite detected a nuclear explosion. Investigators believe that the United States might be covering up the reality that Israel and South Africa might have access to nuclear power and that they might be working together to create nuclear weapons. These same investigators claim to have evidence that the United States Department of Defense came across conclusive evidence that a nuclear explosion from these regions really did occur, but that they chose to ignore it, to not draw attention to their international conflicts with the region. Recognizing that Israel and South Africa might share in nuclear power is a dangerous idea for the United States. There are certain ulterior motives for the United States to disguise this information from the general public. However, upon further investigation into South Africa's nuclear power industry, officials believe that the South African government could not have made such a powerful nuclear explosive within the time frame that it went off because their access to nuclear power at the time was limited. South Africa was also a part of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Because of this, they allowed foreign parties to view their classified documents revealing the kind of nuclear access they had. Because South Africa seems clean on its own, it gives precedent to the possibility that they collaborated with Israel to test this nuclear explosive. The United States has yet to confirm or deny this possibility. Mystery Airships, 1896-1897 to 1897. 
Almost a decade before the Wright brothers' first flight, numerous sightings of strange, cigar-shaped UFOs were spotted across the United States. Starting in 1896 and continuing to 1897, these mystery airships were bigger and faster than anything else known at that time. The first sighting was reported in the winter of 1896. A light was seen slowly moving through the Sacramento night sky on November 17th, with otherworldly sounds being heard as it passed overhead. The mystery light reappeared on the evening of November 21st, and then subsequently seen over more than half a dozen cities including San Francisco and Oakland and viewed by hundreds of witnesses. Not long after, more unidentified airships would be seen. On the outskirts of Springfield, Missouri, one was seen having crash-landed to the ground. It was 20 feet in length, 8 feet in diameter and propelled by three giant propellers. An on-the-spot witness approached the ship and came across its two pilots. They looked human. However, their language was nothing of this world. They attempted with difficulty to communicate, trying to ascertain the pilot's origins. Eventually, they both pointed upwards and apparently uttered something that sounded like the word Mars, before quickly returning to their airship and launching high into the sky, leaving witnesses completely mystified below. These unidentified objects would also be the first reported stories of alien abduction. The first occurred in April 1897 and involved another mystery airship hovering over a farmer's cattle pen. Upon closer examination, onlookers realized that a cable from the airship had roped up a cow, but was struggling to break free, having become entangled in the pen's fence. The group unsuccessfully tried to free the cow, but the fence itself was torn out of the ground, leaving the ship, cow, and part of the fence all rising slowly into the air and sail off into the sky. Interestingly enough, the airships weren't just after livestock, they tried to take people as well. It was on November the 19th, 1896, two days after the first mystery airship sighting over Sacramento. A US Colonel, H.G. Shaw, was driving his buggy through the countryside near Stockton when he came across what appeared to be a landed airship. Shaw described it as having pointed ends and a silver exterior without any features aside from a rudder for steering. The ship was about 150 feet end-to-end, -end, 25 foot in diameter. Suddenly, to Colonel Shaw's amazement, three slender, seven-foot-tall extraterrestrials exited the craft, all emitting a strange warbling noise. The beings reportedly examined Shaw's buggy before attending to Shaw himself, deciding to physically force him into their craft. Luckily, the stocky, well-built soldier was physically superior to the thin, lanky beings, and the aliens soon gave up fleeing back to their ship and quickly speeding out of sight, leaving Colonel Shaw baffled below. A 1500-year-old Bible argues Jesus' fate Christianity has broken into many sectors throughout the years, each adhering to their own moral codes and interpreting the Bible in different ways. Like any piece of literature, the Bible is indeed up to interpretation. However, it's hard to interpret a story when it was never told in the first place. According to the Ethnography Museum of Ankara, Turkey, a new version of the Bible believed to be 15 to 2,000 years old has resurfaced and caused upheaval to the Christian faith. This is because this Bible includes the Gospel of Barnabas. The story reveals that Jesus was never nailed to the cross, but he was also not the Son of God. This story insists that Jesus was only a prophet and that his fate was not crucifixion at all, but that he instead made it to heaven. However, the story of crucifixion is not completely lost. In this story, Judas Iscariot was believed to be nailed to the cross instead. This book came to light during a heist when a group of thieves attempted to smuggle highly valuable goods across the Mediterranean Sea. This version of the Bible is believed to be worth over $25 million, both for its shocking revelations and antiquity. It's no secret that the world of Christianity and the world of Islam have been at odds for years. However, this contention is largely based on how we as people should interpret Jesus' place in the Bible and thus honour him thereafter. Because this new biblical story reveals that Jesus quite possibly knew the prophet Muhammad and foresaw his arrival, it can be said that if Christians do decide to honour this new gospel, then their teachings and belief systems might align differently. However, it is common practice of any church, but especially the Christian church, 
to pick and choose which stories they want to include in modern practice. After all, it wasn't until the 1970s that the word homosexual was included in the Bible. It takes a keen scholarly eye to authenticate the true intent of Jesus' word at the conception of the Bible, but it takes only several elders of the church to manipulate the transcriptions to align with modern belief systems. While the Vatican remains highly interested in this new finding, it cannot be said whether the entirety of Christianity will change because of it. We do know one thing, though. If this gospel stayed hidden from us for more than 1,500 years, then it is reasonable to wonder what else is out there. Fire aboard the Titanic You have just heard that the reason the Titanic sank was because of an iceberg. Well, what if that was not true at all? What if, in fact, the ship sank because of fire instead? This is exactly what one Irish investigative journalist called Sinan Maloney claims to have happened. After doing in-depth research for more than 30 years, he believed that a fire had caused the ship's hull to weaken. In other words, what could have been a small iceberg collision turned into a major disaster because of the damaged hull, along with criminal negligence. What had apparently taken place was that a fire, allegedly burning since the ship had launched from the Belfast shores, it smouldered on for four long days before it was put out, yet the damage had already been done. The once strong steel was now weakened and more brittle than ever, having been roasted by the heat that reached nearly 1,000 degrees Celsius. The iceberg was the tipping point that completely shredded the hull apart, letting the cold Atlantic waters inside. Maloney never believed that the 300-foot gash would have come from a small graze alone. In his documentary called Titanic, The New Evidence, he explains how the ship's hull had various dark and mysterious marks in several auctioned photographs. What were these marks? Apparently, no one had ever investigated them before. He claims that the fire was greatly downplayed at the time. No one even bothered to think that the fire could have been the whole root cause of the catastrophe that took place. Part of the reason why that might have happened was that Maloney speculated that people were too eager for the Titanic to launch. Because it had been delayed more than once, it was easier to overlook a small fire. However, Maloney believes that given the fire, the ship should have never set out to sea. Perhaps, if people had taken the time to study those marks and delayed the ship one more time, the maiden voyage would have been successful. However, it was human error and the hand of fate that played a cruel twist in the mystery of the Titanic. Teddy Roosevelt on Bigfoot Theodore Roosevelt was the 26th President of the United States and a greatly skilled writer among his other talents. He wrote on a large variety of topics and subjects, including memoirs about his time with the Rough Riders, military history novels, and books containing information about his hunting experiences. In his personal writings, he discussed a myriad of different animals that he hunted, which did not include any encounters particularly supernatural or strange like a ghost or a Bigfoot. However, although he never wrote about seeing or hunting a Bigfoot himself, he did write about someone else's encounter with one in his book The Wilderness Hunter, which was published in 1893. This story was told to him by someone that he described as a grizzled, weather-beaten old mountain hunter, whose name was Bauman. The sighting occurred near the Salmon River, which runs between Idaho and Montana. It was claimed that Bauman was hunting around with another man when they realized they were being followed by what they originally suspected was a bear. The two were hunting and beaver trapping when the creature was found to be stalking them, and it ransacked their camping grounds when they were gone. The next day, while Bauman was out hunting, the other man was fatally attacked and left there with a broken neck. Roosevelt wrote that Bauman ran, leaving behind all of his resources except for his weapon, going as fast as he could all the way down the pass until he was out of the creature's way and pursuit. Bauman was certain he had encountered a North American Sasquatch, which is also referred to as the Great Wood Ape, or as we know it, Bigfoot. Bauman described it as a half-human, half-devil or half-goblin beast, which Roosevelt recorded in the book. 
While Teddy Roosevelt recorded the story from Bauman with as much accuracy as he could, it seemed that he was somewhat hesitant to believe Bauman's encounter. Roosevelt wrote that the most convincing argument for it being true was that Bauman must have believed what he said, for he could hardly repress a shudder at certain points of the tale. Although he added as a point of contention that he was of German ancestry and in childhood had doubtless been saturated with all kinds of ghost and goblin lore. This revealed that perhaps Roosevelt thought Bauman believed the creature was a Bigfoot because of the influence of ghost and goblin lore in his upbringing. Whether Bauman's experience was truly with a real Bigfoot or not, it certainly made for a great and interesting story. The Mystery of Tabby's Star Next up is The Mystery of Tabby's Star, more scientifically known as KIC 8462852. If you haven't already heard of this star, it's slightly larger than the Sun and about 1300 light years away. What's even more exciting about the discovery of this star is that it's been known to randomly dim by up to 22% for as long as days at a time. No other stars have been known to do that and have only dimmed slightly if another planet was passing by and blocking light. If it can't be a planet in transit, then what could be causing the light to dim? Scientists have been in awe of this star and racking their brains to come to a viable answer to the intermittent dips in the star's shine. Some possible explanations consist of pieces of comets or destroyed planets. Of course, there are also more unusual possibilities such as an immense orbiting structure that is being built by aliens. Whilst some people strongly believe in those reasons, in 2017, experts got their hands on new research proposing that a ringed planet near Tabby's star could be the culprit for the bizarre light patterns. The ring shape would be able to cover a lot more light than a regularly shaped planet as it takes up much more surface space, so that became a very real possibility. The next question to tackle was why the percentage of dimming varies. Colombian astronomers played with the ringed planet theory and explained that the gravitational interactions would cause the ring to flap up and down, changing the amount of light. Although there are various theories, each one holds many problems, and we can't be certain that they are adequate explanations. For example, the ring would have to be large enough to block the light from a star larger than the Sun, which would be approximately three times the size of Saturn's ring. The issue that the possibility of the moving ring presents is that it wouldn't account for random dimming, only the periodic aspect of the dimming light. It's clear that at this point in time, we still have a lot of work to do before we're able to draw any conclusions about Tabby's star. What do you think? Could there be a super Saturn somewhere light years away? We may never find out in our lifetime, but it would most definitely be an interesting discovery. So, what do you make of these unsolved mysteries? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comments section below and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.